So now I would like to turn our to our opening plenary. Um, we're going to hear from federal, state, tribal, and fishery uh, ocean priorities and consider the potential impacts of the Biden administration priorities on ocean ocean planning. Uh, you know, I think we're a lot of things are being driven by both at the state level and the federal level. So it's it's good to, for us to, to coordinate and hear about all the things that are happening. Uh, so we've got a great people, a uh, great group of people lined up to hear from today, and I'm really excited to learn about all the opportunities and challenges um, from these unique perspectives. So first up, I'm going to turn it back to Keisha to introduce our first speaker from the for the federal perspectives. Keisha. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much, Keith Atkins. That was absolutely beautiful. It is my honor to introduce Director Amanda Lefton of BOEM. Prior to serving as a director for BOEM, Amanda Lefton most recently served as the first assistant secretary for energy and environment for the governor of New York, where she led the state's climate and environmental initiatives and managed a portfolio of 12 agencies and authorities. In this role, she championed and advanced implementation of landmark nation, landmark nation leading climate and renewable energy strategies. Previously, Amanda was the Deputy Policy Director for the Nature Conservancy in New York and has worked in many other positions ranging from labor to New York State Legislature. I first met Director Lefton in her position at PNC. At every step of her career, she has been exceptionally effective at moving planning into action, vision into reality, with the ability to see the minute detail that goes into the bigger picture. I can't think of anyone better to serve at Bowen during this critical time of ocean planning and opportunity. I'm also so very appreciative that she was able to carve time out of her busy, her busy schedule to join us today. Thank you, Director Lefton. I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much, Keisha. It's so wonderful to see you and to be here with you today. I really am so grateful for the opportunity to uh, be here with this really important group as it's thinking about and wrestling with these really important questions. Uh, and advancing ocean planning, which I believe is just so foundational to so many critical issues that are, are driving forward at this time. An incredibly important discussion indeed. Uh, so again, I, I'd like to thank you all for having me on behalf of the Department of Interior and BOEM. I'm really pleased to be here today. I currently live and work in Troy, New York, which I recognize as the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee and Mohican peoples. I acknowledge the place-based knowledge of these peoples and am grateful for their ancestral and current stewardship of these lands. I'm pleased to participate in the third annual Mid-Atlantic Ocean Forum, along with uh, representatives from New York, New Jersey, Del Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the Chickahominy Indian Tribe, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Marie uh, Management Council, and federal agencies. BOEM has a long history of involvement in ocean planning, and we recognize the value of our ongoing collaborative efforts with regional ocean partnerships such as MECO. You know, since his first week in office, President Biden has made tackling the climate crisis a centerpiece of his agenda. As part of this effort, he issued an executive order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, the order directs the Department of Interior to pause new oil and gas leasing on public lands and offshore water pending a comprehensive review of oil and gas leasing and permitting and an evaluation of royalty rates and fiscal terms to ensure a fair return to the taxpayer. We're currently undertaking that review for our offshore oil and gas leasing permitting programs to ensure that they serve the public interest and balance our nation's energy needs with our climate goals to currently benefit current and future generations. This executive order directs federal agencies to elevate certain priorities in federal leasing, including controlling greenhouse gas emissions, advancing environmental justice, and promoting economic growth and family supported jobs. And truly what it lays out is the administration's commitment to really advancing the nation's transition to a cleaner energy future which we expect offshore wind to contribute to significantly. That executive order calls on BOEM to review our offshore renewable energy and permitting process with the goal of doubling energy production from offshore wind by 2030. We know that BOEM will play really a critical role in implementing the White House offshore wind strategy. And to date, 
we've leased approximately 1.7 million acres in the outer continental shelf for offshore wind development and have 17 active leases along the Atlantic. We're really committed to responsibly growing uh, the industry and certainly, of course, with the critical, uh, the critical goal of fighting climate change with the transition to clean energy, but also to reap the important co-benefits of job creation and especially benefits to underserved communities. Excitingly, during a White House forum in late March, the Departments of Interior, Energy and Commerce con committed to a target to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, which could create nearly 80,000 jobs. To help meet that ambitious target, Bowen plans to advance new lease sales and complete the review of the construction and operation plans that are before us and uh, in, in good standing. And notably, those 16 COPs before us now represent more than 19 gigawatts of new clean energy for our nation. At that same forum, the Department of Interior also announced that we had finalized the wind energy areas for the New York bite. As you all know, many people uh, have participated in this process, uh, so you're well aware that Boehm's area identification process identifies offshore locations that seem to be the most suitable for wind energy development while considering the coexistence with all ocean users. This is an important planning effort uh, during which the identification process, we, we received comments from public and government entities, and we also removed areas that were highest conflict for multiple ocean users from consideration. The wind energy areas are adjacent to the greater metropolitan tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So it's home to more than 20 million people. It's the largest population center in the United States. So ensuring that there is renewable energy uh, that's close to that area is of course critical for the future of our nation's transition. Our next step in the process is an environmental review with public input to consider potential impacts of potential site characterization activities. And once that's complete, we'll, pu we'll publish a proposed sale notice for public comment. We also, at that same forum, announced the initiation of Ocean Wind, which is a new wind energy facility off the coast of New Jersey, which would be the nation's third utility scale offshore wind project if approved. And it will bring a total capacity of 1100 megawatts, enough to power 500,000 homes in New Jersey. We previously announced environmental reviews for Vineyard Wind off Massachusetts, South Fork off of Rhode Island waters, but of course is contracted with New York. And we're anticipating initiating additional reviews for projects later this year. And I think it's, it's incredible to look back at the last hundred days, the role that the Department of Interior and Boehm in particular, as well as other federal agencies like the Departments of Commerce and Departments of Energy have played in advancing offshore wind you know, these announcements and the progress to date truly represent a sea change for our offshore wind permitting process and review. And it demonstrates an all of government approach that will catalyze the industry in the United States. Ultimately, we know that uh, one of the most critical thing to ensure that we are really advancing to meet the administration's goals, as well as ensuring that we have the, the critical robust engagement that is truly necessary to ensure that we are weighing the interests of all ocean users is to create greater certainty in the process. As noted, that's really important, not just for industry, but for the state and local governments uh, participating today, certainly for the tribal nations that need to be more integrated into the process, for the commercial fishing industry, and for other partners and stakeholders this means we're going to build a more efficient, transparent, and effective process for reviewing plans to develop existing leases and an inclusive and expeditious process for identifying areas for potential lease sales in the future. BOEM is working to advance this uh, an efficient and expeditious schedule for offshore wind development. We know the challenges we face regarding the climate crisis are too dire to delay. But let me be clear. Our desire to move forward will not outpace our steadfast commitment to do this right. Creating greater certainty 
is also really important for mid-Atlantic states where you have several projects already underway in various stages. For example, the first offshore wind turbines in federal waters became fully operational last October. We have steel in the water. They're located about 27 miles offshore Virginia Beach. The Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Pilot Project, or we call it CVAO, consists of two six megawatts turbines that are connected to the grid. BOEM is capturing lessons learned in reviewing and approving and installing this pilot project. The CVAL project is also helping us gain a better understanding of, of sound mitigation and potential environmental challenges due to the presence of turbines. And I really encourage everyone to attend the forum session tomorrow, what we have learned and what we need to know to inform offshore wind siting. Um, and not only do I encourage you to participate because I think it will be interesting, but also importantly, because it's uh, moderated by Daryl Francois with Boehm's Office of Renewable Energy Programs, and he will do an excellent job, I am sure, leading that really important session. As you all know, 34 million people call the Mid-Atlantic Coastal States regions their home. The area hosts a number of ocean activities, including transportation, commercial and recreational fishing, tourism, science and research, and now renewable energy production. Public input plays an essential role in identifying and mitigating any impacts from proposed energy development activities. That's why outreach and public engagement is a critical component of BOEM's offshore wind project. This is especially important due to the regional nature of ocean uses and the outer continental shelf renewable energy development. Activity off of one state can impact neighboring states. Consequently, the perspective from regional ocean partnerships like MAKO are so important in the planning process. In fact, I would say the New York Bight is a good example of a collaborative process between local, state, and federal stakeholders and tribal governments. When energy designations come after more than three years of review and consideration involving multiple stakeholders, BOEM will continue to work with our many stakeholders as we move forward with offshore wind development. And notably, I'll say, of course, that strengthening nation-to-nation -nation relationships between the United States and tribal nations is an important focal area for the administration. We are incredibly excited by Secretary Holland's leadership, engagement, and partnership with tribal nations, which will be a top priority for the Department of Interior and a top priority for me at, at BOEM. BOEM has a deep respect for tribal self-determination and sovereignty, and we will consider your perspectives meaningfully as we move forward. And that includes incorporating traditional ecological and cultural knowledge into our uh, decision-making and review processes, and also ensure that we are proactively engaging and uh, consulting with tribal governments uh, more, more robustly moving forward. That said, of course, um, the climate crisis is here before us now. And transitioning to a clean energy future is critical to tackle climate change for us and for future generations. But truly, the full environmental and economic benefits of offshore energy can only be realized if we as a nation come together to ensure all potential development is considered and advanced responsibly. BOEM will play a central role in the administration's priorities as we move forward. Robust stakeholder outreach and scientific integrity will continue to be important components of our offshore energy program development, and all of our decisions will be transparent and rely on best available data. We will continue to listen to all of our stakeholders and partners and work with industry, tribal government partners, the fishing communities, conservation organization, and labor unions to ensure that any future offshore energy and mineral development is done in a safe and responsible manner. And to achieve that, we really look forward to continuing to work with our regional ocean partnerships like MAKO here today to enhance coordination, engage with partners and stakeholders, and increase collaboration as we advance the administration's climate and renewable energy goals and help create a cleaner, more equitable energy future for our nation. Thank you so much for having me here today. I look forward to hearing more about the great conversations that unfold in the next couple of days. And thank you, a personal note uh, to Keisha for her really incredible and great leadership in the state of New York and beyond. It is a great pleasure to get to continue to work with you. Thank you so much for having me here today.
Great, Amanda. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful to hear uh, all the work that's going on at, at BOEM and, and on the federal side to help us all advance uh, these issues that are critical to the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, so next up, I, we're going to hear from a, a tribal perspective. So with my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelsey Leonard of the Shinnecock Indian Nation. Dr. Leonard is a water scientist, uh, legal scholar, policy expert, writer, and enrolled citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. Dr. Leonard is also an assistant professor in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo, and where her research focuses on, on indigenous water justice and its climatic, territorial, and governance underpinnings. So Dr. Leonard seeks to establish indigenous traditions of water conservation as a foundation of international water policymaking. She serves uh, as a member of the Great Lakes Water Quality Board of the, of the International Joint Commission. Uh, her regional ocean policy work in collaboration with tribes, state, federal, and fishery management council uh, entities uh, received a Peter Benchley Ocean Award for Excellence in Solutions. Uh, she also represents the Shinnecock Indian Nation on the, the MAKO Steering Committee. And I can definitely say having Kelsey as a partner has been critical uh, in making all these efforts a success. So with that, let's turn it over to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to, to be with you today, to be with our core team. Um, this really, this whole forum would not have been possible, but for the, the wonderful work of our, our Marco staff, as well as uh, MAKO Steering Committee and our broader MAKO membership. Um, but even more so, it would not be possible, but for the folks who are streaming in today to, to listen to all of this wonderful work. Um, and I will, I will start by just sharing a, a few thoughts and then turn it over to my other colleagues who also also want to share their perspectives on where we've been in, in the past year. Uh, thank you to Director Lefton for, for those remarks about BOEM. I, I do uh, believe that the new administration has shown a renewed commitment to renewable energy and, and um, cautiously optimistic, uh, as, as Director Lefton noted, that that push will also come with a renewed respect for tribal sovereignty and the just transition to renewable energies. It has been a difficult year for tribes uh, and for our tribal nations. We have faced a disparate impact of the pandemic across our communities um, with disproportionate rates of both contraction and mortality from COVID-19. And that has also been very pronounced in the context of the fisheries and, and ocean resource policy and planning. Our tribal fisheries have been uh, devastated in, in large ways by COVID-19 along with other coastal communities around the United States and in the Mid-Atlantic. And so I, I am hopeful that through new pieces of legislation and resource allocation uh, that our tribal fishers can, can bounce back and can really um, be allowed the opportunity to be the resilient communities that they are. In the past year, we have also seen new types of legislation uh, put forward under the previous administration and now with hopefully um, more, more hope for, for actual uh, passage under the current administration in terms of ocean-based climate solutions. COVID-19 and the pandemic has showed us that our climate crisis is not stopping, even though we do have a pandemic. And, and so we need these climate solutions that are resilient and incorporative of our, our ocean-based solutions to be able to have a shared sustainable path moving forward. And so we need to keep continue to keep pushing for that. We need to continue to keep pushing for the, the good work that our regional ocean partnerships do in bringing together diverse entities to be collaborative and, and design our future in a way that represents all Americans, not just a select few. I've also seen over the past year a renewed commitment to, to mapping um, and not just to, to mapping data within a biophysical sense, but to mapping data across justice spectrums, uh, particularly ocean justice, as we will talk through later throughout the course of, of this week and, and of our forum together. Uh, as, as MAKO, we are committed to, to mapping more, more aspects of our data that relate to ocean justice, and I'm excited for where that future will take us. And lastly, over the past year, I have been a part of a wonderful um, work group of MAKO that has been supported by our larger um, MAKO planning work to renew our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And I am excited for where that work uh, has taken us in terms of this year's forum and where it will continue to take us in the future to ensure that our work is representative of all coastal communities throughout the Mid-Atlantic. So Tabuti, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to our team.
Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, it's great. All the work you've been doing has, has been fantastic. Um, it's really great to have you as a partner in all that we're doing. So thank you. Uh, so now um, we're going to move forward into um, our state and regional perspectives panel. Uh, so we have a large group of really great folks here. Um, we'll do a little round robin where we pose an initial question for our panel to respond to, and we'll go from north to south initially. Uh, and then we'll flip the order and we'll pose our second question. Um, and then we can go back through our panelists so they all have an opportunity to answer that. Um, so after we go through that, then we're gonna open it up to a discussion. Uh, and, and Kelsey, please, uh, when we go back to the panel, please join us there. So we would definitely like to have your perspectives as part of that discussion. Um, sadly, uh, Director Lefton had to leave before she could join the panel. So we'll, we'll miss having her there. Um, we we uh, asked everyone to provide bios for us uh, to tell you, basically show you how great of a group that we have lined up here. Um, so impressive, in fact, I, you know, we went through everyone's bio. I think we'd run out of time for discussion. So I, I'm really just going to introduce them as we go through the list here. It's just from where they are. I, you know, they're that high profile that if you simple Google, <laughs> you will find a lot of information and, and where they're from and what they've been doing. I mean, it's really great. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge that when you build a panel with so many important people, uh, you run the risk of losing some to critical concerns that pop up in their states. Uh, so we do have a slight change to the agenda. Uh, we will be uh, missing Sean LaTourette, our acting commissioner from New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. But we do have someone who's able to step in for him. And so I'll definitely welcome her uh, in turn to, as we go through this. Um, so first, I, I'm, I'll just go through the questions first and then we'll, then we'll go through the list here. So uh, our first question, uh, from your perspective, what are the ocean issues that are most important for your state and the region? and what action should be taken or avoided um, to advance these priorities. So with that, I'm, I'm going to open this first up. Um, we're going to start with Doreen Harris, who is the president and CEO of the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority at NYSERDA. Um, so I will give it over to uh, Doreen. Great, thank you, Kevin. And um, I really do want to thank the entire organization for hosting me today um, on this important panel discussion. Um, first of all, I, I, I couldn't be happier to follow Director Lefton because it is true that when we think about our work, we think about it in an entirely new context. Um, this new federal context is one that is very much aligned with the interests of New York State and and generally in the work that we have been undertaking for a number of years uh, in, in this context. So um, it is important to note that our particular policy in New York with respect, most notably um, for this topic, is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which sets forth some of the most ambitious uh, climate and clean energy goals in the nation. But I think it's important to note that in doing so, we really look at these resources from a comprehensive perspective, which is why I see close alignment between the points that, um, that were made earlier and the work that we've done. A very strong focus on responsible development, a very strong focus on is issues of justice, and by justice I mean climate justice, um, environmental justice, and beyond. Um, and when we think about the ocean issues, that are most important for our state and our region, it is in that context um, that we come forward. So we are um, strongly committed to working with states and industry partners in the Mid-Atlantic to promote notably offshore wind development that benefits us all. New York's goal of nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035 is the largest in the nation, but I would say that it has been advanced in the most comprehensive way as well. And quite frankly, the status quo and continued reliance on carbon-based fuels is simply not a responsible posture for our oceans. That's really our baseline condition. Without dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, fundamentally wildlife and habitats will be significantly impact, impacted. So New York's offshore wind goals seek to address this challenge head on but in a mindful way to protect the environment, the ocean ecosystems, and maritime users as well. 
And as I said, partnerships and collaboration are the hallmark of our holistic approach and critical elements to planning for the future and bringing stakeholders to the table in a way that help us reach economies of scale faster, develop a domestic supply chain more quickly and efficiently, and also utilizes ports and workers all along the East Coast. So since the beginning of our offshore wind program many years ago, we at NYSERDA have prioritized identifying and engaging with key stakeholder groups, along with our fellow state agencies, um, notably routine ocean users, such as mariners and fishermen, whose activities will help shape offshore wind development. The New York Bight, simply stated, is ecologically and economically significant and increasing our understanding of the marine environment and its existing uses through monitoring is critical to informing how we effectively mitigate risks. So we have open communication and collaboration, not only among state agencies, but also with our neighboring states. And we do believe that regional cooperation can deliver a resilient, coordinated, and efficient offshore wind industry. So we have been working regularly with the regional states you'll hear from today, but also environmental organizations and federal agencies to develop a regional wildlife science entity to support and coordinate regional wildlife research and monitoring. And we also remain fully engaged with our technical working groups, which were formed a number of years ago, such as those focusing on environmental, fishing, and maritime technical issues. And so for many years, these groups have been meeting and discussing issues routinely. And these interactions are continuing and creating outcomes, tangible outcomes, such as fishing transit lanes and the public sales notice released by BOEM and best management practices embedded in NYSERDA's offshore wind procurements as contractual requirements. In addition, we at NYSERDA have a fisheries manager dedicated to offshore wind and fisheries concerns who regularly consults with members of the fishing industry to understand the unique concerns and challenges of fishermen as it pertains to offshore wind development and also ensures that the fishing community is kept apprised of the latest developments about offshore wind development and our state's approach. We also have the same approach in place for the recreational side with a recreational fisheries liaison. So the work of both these individuals ensures an ongoing and open dialogue with the fishing community and provides the opportunity for NYSERDA to work collaboratively with our fishing partners now and into the future. So in general, based on these years of experience and dialogue with stakeholders, and especially now at this critical planning juncture that Director Lefton noted, as we consider lease areas in the New York Bight, we specifically need to pay attention to the coordination of turbine layouts among and between lease areas to maximize fishing and maritime access to and through turbine arrays avoiding conflicts with maritime trade routes specifically, but also ensuring the safe and efficient passage by fishermen and other maritime users through these transit lanes. And then we also need to pay attention to what the research tells us about these species that are at risk, including their temporal and spatial presence and behavior, which can help refine construction windows and undertake adaptive management and mitigation measures on a regional basis. So these are a few notes um, on the basis of this multi-year effort. Um, certainly will be evolving again, as many have noted over time, but in this important juncture, we stand ready um, to collaborate with all of you even more so as we advance this important resource together. Thank you for having me. Hey, Doreen, thank you so much. Um, I know personally I've <laughs> done a lot of work and, and join in a lot of listening in a lot of the technical working groups that you pull together and it's been really critical and shares a lot of information. So it's really helping to advance everything across the region. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So next up, I'm going to have uh, Katie Aragon. Uh, she is the Associate Commissioner for uh, Science and Policy at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, Katie has been <laughs> thrust into this at the last possible moment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our commissioner was pulled away to a different 
emergency that you had to, to deal with. Um, so I will, if hopefully you are available, Katie, and we'll turn it to you. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, especially at the last moment here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. In my 20 plus years here at DEP, I have not had the opportunity to meet with this group. Um, it is an impressive group and the, the work is um, daunting, but it sounds like everyone is up to the challenge and I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, and I also understand from my colleague Kevin that uh, our time is short and our panel is large, so I will endeavor to cut my comments down a bit. Um, for New Jersey's perspective, the most important challenge uh, in the ocean uh, is climate change, resulting in rising sea levels, changing ocean temperatures, shifting species, um, and changes in ocean chemistry. Uh, and also, we are, of course, committed to addressing these issues with a focus on environmental justice. We understand very clearly that our vulnerable communities will be impacted first and worse, and that they are less able to respond. In short, we think of climate change as a threat multiplier for our overburdened communities. And unfortunately, uh, sea level rise is increasing at a greater rate in New Jersey than most other parts of the world, making our state and our way of life more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The science tells us that there is a 50% chance that sea level rise will meet or exceed 1.4 feet and a 17% chance that it will meet or exceed 2.1 feet by 2050. This will result in increased coastal flooding during sunny days and storm events that will impact our infrastructure, our residents, and our businesses. And sea level rise will further rise by 2100, even if the current uh, efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are successful. Experts project that there is a 50% chance that sea level rise will be more than three feet by 2100 and a 17% chance that it will rise by more than five, meet, five feet. Unabated carbon dioxide emissions are reducing the ocean's pH. And as a result, this group knows all too well that the ocean is 30% more acidic since the start of the industrial age, which could impact important marine and estuarine life and New Jersey's thriving fishing industry. Southern New Jersey counties rank second in the United States in the economic dependence on shelled mollusks which will suffer from increased ocean acidity. Another major challenge from the climate-induced changes in the ocean along the Atlantic coast is the warming ocean temperatures, causing a shift northward, northward of aquatic species, which will impact resource management and fisheries, as well as creating suitable ha habitat for in introduced invasives that otherwise could not successfully overwinter off the coast of New Jersey. And we are clearly already seeing impacts and that from climate change uh, is, and the ones that are ha uh, happening on the ocean. But we can also look to the ocean as part of the solution. We see our oceans as a source of clean energy and Governor Murphy has put us on a path to offshore wind energy generation with a goal, an aggressive goal of 7,500 megawatts by 2035. And it is hard to overstate the importance of advancing sustainable offshore wind energy. In addition, New Jersey is working to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions while simultaneously adapting to future challenges through rulemaking and planning. And I'm proud to say that we released our draft climate change resilience strategy during Earth Week two weeks ago. And this is our first step in New Jersey, making New Jersey more resilient by identifying strategic priority areas and outlining a multi-pronged path forward as we face growing climate impacts. The strategy outlines six state priorities, each of which includes recommendations to guide state and local government efforts to protect vulnerable communities, infrastructure, businesses, and the environment from the devastating effects of climate change. I'll keep my comments short as promised, um, and thanks again for having me. Great, thank you so much, Katie. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, with that, well, I'm gonna switch over to Kimberly Cole. Kim is the administrator of uh, for the coastal programs with the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. Uh, so, Kim, thank you for joining us. I also just want to mention that you know, after this year, you will be joining us on the Mako Steering Committee. So we're excited to have you there. Um, and she will also be getting her role as chair of Marco. So 
big things coming for Kim. Uh, <laughs> may feel like we put a few ringers here in our panel with Kelsey and Kim, but hey, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with it. So, thank you, Kim. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> yes, uh, very excited to be uh, joining both the MAKO Steering Committee soon and uh, continuing working with the MARCO States. Um, so uh, I also have uh, some short uh, questions or short uh, responses to start off. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm definitely excited to be here participating in the third Mid-Atlantic Ocean Forum. Uh, I'd also like to give a big thank you to the planning committee. I'm looking forward to hearing from the great lineup of speakers and topics through the week ahead. Um, as to the question at hand and from my perspective, um, Delaware is a small state comparatively in the region. We're small yet mighty, and uh, we deeply value our ocean resources. We are actively involved in several work groups in the region on issues ranging from marine debris, advancing Governor Carney's Keep DE litter-free campaign, to understanding the impacts of ocean and coastal acidification, as well as ensuring we have the best available ocean resource and use data, be it related to administrative boundaries, marine life abundance, oceanography, or human uses. Delawareans rely upon and enjoy our abundant coastal resources in a typical year. Granted, the last one has not been typical. In a typical year, the tourism industry is the state's fourth largest employer. Much of the tourism activities can be attributed to Delaware's 381 miles of ocean, coastal bays, and tributary shoreline. Approximately 60,000 jobs directly or indirectly support the fishing, tourism, and recreation sectors. Ocean and coast-related activities contribute almost $7 billion in economic production to the state. The coast and our marine resources are huge economic drivers, so preserving the coastal environment and balancing the multiple uses is essential to Delaware's economic well-being, as well as being vital to maintaining a high quality of life for its residents. So, how do we sustain that? With all the competing uses that take place in the ocean and the increased emphasis on renewable energy and offshore wind in particular in the region, it's a priority for us that the best information and data is made available and shared throughout the region to help inform decision making. Leveraging shared local research and monitoring needs that help answer questions and provide data can and should be identified and addressed at a regional scale be it related to offshore wind operation and transmission, shifting species as climate changes, or identifying regional sand resources. Advancing actions to improve information and data will in turn promote the sustainable use of our ocean's resources and the blue economy for the region. Uh, thanks and I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Great to hear from you on, the, on our panel here. So, <laughs> um, Next up, uh, we have Bill Anderson. He's a sec Assistant Secretary for Aquatic Resources at Maryland's Department of Natural Resources. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Great. Kevin, thank you so much for the, for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to be a part of the uh, panel today. Um, you know, in terms of managing these issues from Maryland's perspective, I'm, I'm actually, <clears throat> excuse me, quite blessed in that I manage an integrated team that deals with fisheries from oceans to the bay to our upland freshwater um, fisheries, hydrographics, navigation, our analytics and, and sampling capabilities all fall within my team, shoreline management, uh, which of course uh, includes climate change and um, uh, sea level rise, storm event planning, what have you. And we also, um, are benefited by the fact that the Maryland Geological Survey and our energy project review teams all fall within that aquatic resources team that I have the honor to manage. So it's very easy for us to integrate uh, and work among each other to, uh, to drive solutions for the state of Maryland and hopefully to, to assist the region and the Atlantic Coast in, in uh, uh, the overall efforts. Um, in Doreen's comment, she mentioned context. 
and I think context kind of is the is the the word of the day in terms of how Maryland uh, addresses uh, these ocean issues. And and the reason for that, and, and maybe a little bit of, of background, um, Maryland's a state that that along our Atlantic coast we have a resort town that swells to 300,000 people in the summertime. Uh, we have a significant national seashore, uh, a, an adjacent state seashore, and we uh, have the moniker of being the white marlin capital of the world. That occurs in a 33 mile, or 31 mile, I'm sorry, coastline from the state of Maryland. So that doesn't seem terribly significant, although we ran a lot of stuff in that, in that very small uh, piece of real estate. But you put that in context of our um, tidal coastal, and we have the the uh, the, the honor of, of sharing a, a very unique tributary resource with our, um, uh, our our colleagues down in Virginia, known as the Chesapeake Bay. When you add that in, uh, our coastline is over 3,000 uh, miles long. So that kind of changes our focus on how we look at ocean management to more of being a coastal zone uh, integrated management approach. Um, so that kind of you know integrates together the Atlantic issues, uh, our coastal bays issues, and of course the Chesapeake Bay and tributary issues, or the or the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So our ocean issues are not a monolith, and the ocean issues really are a um, subset of these larger coastwide issues, um, coastal zone issues that we try to manage. Um, so. In Maryland, what, what enters the, the, the conversation is what we are beginning to call the One Water Initiative. Um, for those of you who've been around for a while, you may remember when Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor of California, he loved to use the term to think differently. And we're trying to, to leverage that concept of the One Water uh, Initiative to think differently about how we manage uh, issues related to the water and the coast as one kind of integrated uh, unit. Um, we try to look at the Chesapeake Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, and the and stormwater, wastewater, uh, uh, water use, land use, especially along the critical area uh, of our coasts, um, and climate change, all is one. Um, with each subcomponent of that, uh, of those things that I just listed, as directly impacting each of the others. The issues, the way we look at them, they don't change uh, in terms of what I believe uh, each other state is looking at. Economic and, and, and uh, ecological um, impacts of our waters. Um, the uh, coastline and watershed development issues. The intensity of the human influences on those resources. And the newer challenges of climate change, sea level rise, and catastrophic events. And then, of course, uh, important to, to life itself is, is water quality impairments. So we're just trying to look at all, view all of these issues through a slightly different lens, um, but using uh, a tried and true platform that, that you and all are very familiar with, and that is the, uh, that, that balances and integrates, and that is the coastal zone management approach um, to, to leading on these issues. Now, with all that said, there are a couple of issues, just two issues I want to just throw out for consideration, uh, not necessarily being more important or less important than anything else, but some, some that are maybe slightly different than what we've heard so far. The first one, actually, Kate did mention uh, in her, her list of, of the concerns of New Jersey, um, but one that, that impacts us throughout all of our waters in the state of Maryland, that is acidification. Um, and we all know that as, as the pH changes, there are going to be um, species that benefit, and there are going to be species that end up being losers. But the, but the reality is that, that when you have winners and losers, the overall food chain is going, to, is going to have a negative impact to it. And that negative impact multiplies as, as that food chain becomes closer to us humans. Um, the complexity of the system makes the outcomes unpredictable at this point. Um, but the vector obviously suggests that, that um, um, problems continue to loom ahead and, and will get worse. In Maryland, and, and Kate mentioned this as well, uh, the shellfish um, industry, the commercial industry, which is both in Maryland, is both uh, 
wild caught and farm raised. Um, we see that the science suggests that at least that part of our industry uh, will be on the loser side of, of, of what's, what's happening or transpiring over the next coming decades and centuries. The second issue that I, that I want to just throw out for consideration relates to the mechanics of building climate resilience. And I've got a team that, that spends a tremendous amount of time uh, working with the Maryland Climate Change Commission on a hardening of our shorelines and our, our uh, land-based assets from uh, climate change and worsening storms. And the issue specifically relates to dredge material as a resource to install climate uh, resilient solutions. We focused a lot of attention on um, the use of these, uh, um, these materials, uh, the dredge materials, as our, um, the, the, uh, the material to, to put these solutions in place. It's pretty clear that the, that the demand for these materials are going to increase over time. Um, and the question is, the, the, um, the inventory of that material is available um, over the long term. The question we keep asking ourselves is, is there going to be a lack of that material that may be a limiting factor in our ability to continue um, in developing these resiliency projects, or will it slow our efforts into the, into the future? The other issue that we're, we're scratching our heads on a lot and are very concerned about is, is uh, uh, something my um, former boss, Tom Rumsfeld, at the Pentagon used to call the unknown unknowns or the, the law of unintended consequences. As we use these materials to deal with the, this, this identified problem of, of um, the effects of sea level rise, as we harvest those materials for use, um, are we then going to create a new problem uh, in, our, in our efforts to fix an old one? And, and you know, history is full of examples of that happening over and over and over again because we just don't have a good, hard, strong handle on what those unintended consequences are. I think, Kevin, I'll kind of uh, leave it at that, just throw out a couple of thoughts for maybe some additional consideration, but I do really appreciate the time uh, and the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Hey Bill, thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's it's clear that there, uh, the ocean is heavily interconnected with, with the coasts and and everything, you know, all the resources that we have to try and manage and balance. So thank you so much. Uh, next up, I'm going to turn it over to Ellen Bowen, and Ellen is the deputy director of the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. Hi, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm excited to be here at this third meeting of this of this group. I think that it provides an excellent forum to talk about a lot of the issues that have been raised today. Uh, very thankful for the, all the work that staff has put in on this and for everybody who's taking time out of their afternoon to join us. Um, I think a lot of the issues have been, many other states have spoken about the issues regarding climate change and that we know it's a coming issue and we know a lot of the challenges that are going to be that are going to occur so shifting stocks so ocean acidification so the next question is you know what do we do about it and how do we begin to prepare our constituents our stakeholders our resource users and our laws to be able to adapt to to this change um, i'm very proud in virginia to work under the leadership of governor northam and secretary matt strickler as they have taken pretty big steps to start to address some of this um, Virginia passed an executive order last fall for a coastal master plan to address sea level rise and to improve coastal resiliency in Virginia, like Maryland. We have a lot of coastline um, and we have a lot of people who live on that coastline, um, not just homeowners, but we are also home to one of the world's largest naval bases, numerous Air Force and Navy installations. And so it's critical that we understand so how, how this is going to affect a, a wide swath of, of resource users. We also passed an executive order 77 that will address uh, single use plastic and plastic waste in our oceans to try to decrease some of the um, some of the input into our waters and to try to reduce some of the additional stressors. Uh, Governor Northam and Deputy Secretary Ann Jennings have also been leaders on the Chesapeake Bay Protection Act and working to ensure that we are meeting our goals under that. Um, as Bill said, you know, these bodies flow into one another, they are all interconnected, and understanding the steps that we take in the Bay is critical to understanding what is going to happen out in our, in our ocean waters. 
So one of the things we've talked a lot about is resources. We talk about oysters and ocean acidification. We talk about fish moving north. And a phrase I often use is, but we don't manage resources. We manage the people that use them. And so I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is understanding how our existing state and federal regulatory frameworks can, can be flexible and can to adapt to some of the changing climates. So I'll give you a, a pretty in the weeds example in Virginia, but I think it's illustrative of what are some of the challenges we're facing. So Virginia passed a, a living shorelines uh, law two years ago to require the use of living shorelines as the best available science allows. And we are also looking at how to address upland and the resource protection areas from the Chesapeake Bay Protection Act. And we're running into some questions of how do we make sure that these two parts of just Virginia's code can talk to each other and can be consistent. And now imagine that up and down the 15 states on the Atlantic seaboard, the five states that comprise Marco, and try to figure out you know, where, where can we adapt and where can we change, understanding that it's a little bit easier to change state law, it's a little bit harder to change federal law, and do we have the regulatory infrastructure to accept these changes? Um, another big issue with this is going to be fisheries allocations. Um, Bill, sits on the, Bill sits on the ASMFC, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission with me. Peter Defer, who we'll talk in a minute, sits on the Mid-Atlantic Management Council with me. And we have been through some really tough conversations around how do we reallocate fisheries resources as they move north. And understanding how those fish are moving north and the economic impacts of some of those communities while also trying to identify what are the economic impact of some of those communities possibly from offshore wind. How do we look at possible minor displacement from offshore wind with species shifting north due to climate change? It's beginning to understand what is the cumulative effect of a lot of these policies and changes that I think is really important and one of the harder issues for us to tackle moving forward. Thanks, Kevin. Great, thank you. <laughs> Everything disappeared for a second there on me. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Uh, yeah, it's it's great. There's a lot of challenges there, and I think we're gonna have to start thinking about you know how we look at these things creatively. Uh, so next up, um, Dr. Peter Defer, uh, representing the Mid Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, I want to first uh, thank Mike Luisi for asking me to step in and take this place. Mike is the chairman of the Fishery Management Council and was otherwise occupied with uh, the other. Man fishery management unit that Ellen referred to, the ASMFC, and so he's got that on his agenda for the afternoon. Um, and I want to remind the audience that the, man the federal fishery management has no coastline. We start at the three mile limit and we extend out to 200 miles. So we don't have any regulatory and jurisdictional control over all of those efforts and activities that that the previous speakers have referred to that are land-based, either because they are on land or because they discharge into coastal waters. So we're, those are out of our control, although we are subject to their influence. And uh, there are two huge issues that, uh, that loom before the Federal the, the Fishery Management Council, all of them. There are eight Fishery Management Councils, New England, to the north and, and the South Atlantic to the south are our two sister organizations. The first one being uh, global warming and climate change that we've heard a bit about. And I just wanna mention a couple of items regarding how serious this is and sort of giving context to a, a, a point that I made at our last council meeting in which I referred to the fishery consequences as a crisis situation. So having, having been in this business of looking at ocean and, and uh, coastal aspects of fisheries, water quality and habitat for a number of years, um, I, I learned in graduate school that there are two boundaries or borders for our fishery and living resources. One of them being Cape Hatteras, the other one being the other Cape to the north, Cape Cod, because these form two natural boundaries. And so many of our biological resources were set in their natural distributions and their behavior on the basis of those two boundaries. Those, those two boundaries no longer exist as they did for hundreds, if not thousands of years. 
the changes that we have caused to occur in our coastal waters and our habitats have resulted in a breakdown of those borders and those boundaries. And we have faced this in the, in the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council in just the, year, the years that I've been working with them, about 12 years, we have seen movement of species from the south. We have seen blue line tilefish and cobia coming up from the south. We have seen shrimp now in, in Virginia waters, uh, although those are coastal. And I'm, I, you know, I give Alan credit for that. Her agency now has to issue permits for a shrimp fishery in Virginia. Black sea bass now occur in catchable numbers in Maine, where not that many years ago, they were a rare species and people didn't even know what they were if one showed up at the end of the line. Summer flounder have, and that's an expansion of, the, of their range because we have no fewer black sea bass in the south end of the range. Summer flounder seem to be shifting their range to the north and to the east. And then finally, since 2009, we have known that one of our species that's very important uh, in the mid-Atlantic area has undergone a shift to the north. In 1976, the center of the surf clam fishery was in Chincoteague, Virginia, and it is now in New Jersey. And these are animals that you remember have no legs. They might have feet, but they have no legs. So the movement of the entire stock of surf clams that exist in federal waters occurs because the newly recruited clams are now living in a different place than were the, the parents that spawned them. So this is a huge problem. And that's just the biological um, part that we see. What we don't see has been examined and explained to us by reports out of the New England um, uh, Areas Science Center, uh, the Fishery Science Center up in New England, how some of the quality of food for our important fish has declined to the point where they are not thriving, they're not growing, they're not reproducing the way they used to. And that we're seeing some changes that we can't explain yet, but we suspect that they are the result of climate change and global warming. We know that there are changes in water quality. We know that plastic particles and the chemicals that make them up appear in the fish tissue of animals that we catch, fish fisheries that we catch and that go to market. And we have no idea what the consequences are. And those are in federal waters as well as in state waters. So that's a huge problem that we face is what, what we're doing about the climate change and global warming issues. The second one is that we have a congestion problem. We, we need someone to manage the traffic. And I just write down here the few things that we've heard about today, which is wind fishing activities, both commercial and recreational, shipping, military activities, because Ellen pointed out we have Norfolk, which I thought was the largest naval base on the planet, and she said it was one of them. She and I might have to have a conversation offline. And then what has not been mentioned at all, but is coming down the pike, oh no, it's already on the agenda, is aquaculture. It's starting up north, but aquaculture in federal waters is being considered off the coast of Long Island. And the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council deals with federal waters between New York and North Carolina. So we have a pretty big expanse of water to take care of. So this, this traffic cop role has got to be played with. It's got to be handled. And it's not as though we're going to just rely on one of our federal agencies to listen to all voices because we've seen what happens if that listening doesn't result in action. We've already heard where at least one state agency is requiring action on the basis of the input from multiple stakeholders. Unfortunately, I've seen in my, my career that just because the federal government insists that the agency take into account multiple voices, it doesn't mean that there will be any action as a result of that. I refer to Federal uh, Executive Order 12898 
by President Clinton in which he created the Environmental Justice Act. But unfortunate environmental justice activities. Unfortunately, in too many cases, the Environmental Protection Agency concludes that there is an environmental justice issue, but regulations do not yet give them the power to act on that basis. And so additional protective measures have not necessarily been set. We need to do something on the order of where we can act on those multiple voices, not just listen to them. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to, to share the comments of the Mid-Atlantic Council. Thank you. Great, Peter, thank you so much. And I think actually your last comments really helped segue into the next question. So what we're gonna do is turn around and go back to the North and start with you. Um, so what are those opportunities or challenges that would benefit most from greater state, tribal and federal regional coordination you know some of the stuff you just discussed really i think ties into that so it'd be great to hear what you think there sure it's um and there are two um the first one was what i just mentioned is that when we sit down and listen to multiple voices it's not just that every voice is heard but the final decision reflects the needs and the necessity to account for all those multiple uses and multiple um, perspectives we have uh, a need to keep certain resources safe for future use, which means we are not going to harvest everything that we can get our hands on. We're not going to use every available space. And we are going to listen when we are told that is sacred ground and it must be, must be held sacred. So we have to have an agency that is able to rise above all of the required and ingrained issues that our voices bring. And whether it's BOEM that has the legal mandatory requirement to see that they're using uh, the federal waters and the federal resources to maximize um, the, the nation's interests or the federal fishery management where we are not managing the resource, we are managing the fishery for the maximum benefit to the nation or the conservation community that recognizes we have to be able to keep some things aside or the federal agency that uh, that requires that we have to protect rare and endangered species such as the north atlantic right whale and we have to know that one of the biggest uh, risks to them is lines in the water which aquaculture brings which wind might bring but we don't know yet so we have to account for those not just hear the voices the other the other role that the federal government i think is ideally suited to to occupy is the question of resilience and i refer to ecological resilience which is not getting back to normal or putting things the way they were ecological resilience is defined by the, uh, the ecologist from Canada, C.S. Holling, as a system that is able to continue on in time and space without losing its major features. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same. It doesn't mean it's going to have exactly the same components, but it means it will be able to continue. One of the things that we have to do then is find a way for our coastal communities, our fisheries, our fishing communities, the people who rely on them, to have a diversity of their reliance so that if one peg falls out of this system, that the whole system does not fall down. So those are those are my thoughts on it, and that's my contribution. Thank you so much. And I, I guess my, my good friend and colleague from down on the coast is the next one. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, I think that's that'll be really critical. Um, looking at how those things will be changing and understanding you know, what we need to plan for. Uh, so with that, I, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Ellen. And Thank you. Um, so I think Peter made a really good point that I want to build off of, which is talking about resilience and resiliency and, and what that looks like. And it's not, I think oftentimes we can get a little stuck trying to think, how do we just preserve the system as it is? And um, I think it's the ability to, to flex of how do we adopt to the changes, but as Peter was saying, how do we keep sort of the key, the key components um, of the industry or of the area that we're, we're trying to, to pursue? And I think that's a really interesting point. Peter, you might be right. I can't remember if Norfolk is the world's largest naval base. I live near it, so I should know, but we'll go for it. Um, 
I think one of the things that that increased coordination could really serve to help with is um, sort of an exchange of ideas. I think too often um, we end up talking about a lot of the the challenges that we're facing, and I think forums like this provide an opportunity to discuss some of the solutions. So. Um, you know, what is Maryland doing on ocean acidification? What is New Jersey doing? What can Virginia do? And I think it's a, it's the sharing of ideas that I think is really critical and something that I realize seems incredibly straightforward. But I think being deliberative that we're going to provide that forum for people to talk about specific things that they are doing and how to share that information is, is really critical. Um, I think the, the second thing, particularly from a federal coordination perspective, is exactly what Peter, again, Peter is saying and, and others have said is, how do we coordinate all of the resources in federal waters and how do we make sure that there are not contradictory policies and at the same time understanding what are the comprehensive impacts to industry. So if you are looking at, you know, industries in the, you know, further north about trying to decrease lines in the water, but permitting aquaculture, how does that work? Or how does, um, you know, possibly restricting some areas for uh, offshore wind to commercial fishing, but opening up opportunities for recreational fishing, how could that actually shift the dynamic between recreational and commercial allocation? How could that shift the resource use? So I think that the federal government, um, BOEM, uh, NOAA Fisheries in particular, as they coordinate and really work to refine um, an understanding of, of fisheries impacts and how to move forward. And it's that key point of how to move forward. Um, climate change affects everything. Addressing and decreasing carbon emissions is critical for um, marine life, for land life. So it's not a, it's not trying to stop it. It is how do we coordinate and move forward, but how can we understand and, and possibly mitigate some of the, the bigger impacts. But I think really looking comprehensively um, at the federal level is gonna be very helpful. Thanks. Computer's being slow. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think, yeah, we didn't pay anyone to say that we need to make sure that we continue to coordinate, which is what <laughs> a lot of what we try to do is. So thank you. I think it's really critical. Uh, so next, I, I, I'll turn it back to, to Bill, if you would like to share some of his thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thanks again. And uh, you know what? After listening to Peter and Ellen, I, I think I'm going to take a little different tack uh, with a few minutes. So I'm going to talk about this subject. Ellen detailed um, the challenges that we are having in the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And of course, that's one issue in, in a much broader set of issues as relating to managing our waters. Um, and she talked about the, 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 the gut-wrenching twisting that we had discussions at our last meeting, and, and uh, we're actually in the midst of the kickoff of ASMFC for this quarter right now, um, related to, to fisheries allocations. And um, those discussions got so, so tense that we actually had individuals who were members of the commission, uh, appointed by their governor, their legislature, what have you, suggesting that we potentially outboard our decisions to a third party, not facilitating discussions, but actually outboarding this, the, 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 uh, uh, the decisions. To me, that's a very scary place to be. And, and you know, uh, making hard decisions is a part of this organization. Uh, it's part of ASMFC, the Mid-Atlantic Council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's gonna be a big challenge. And then Peter's comments about, uh, and I'm Peter, I probably am going to butcher your words, and I apologize. Um, rising above the voices, that listening to them, I think that, that the biggest challenge for an organization like this is really the organization itself, because each of us represents a, um, a discipline, each of us represents a state or a, or a tribe or, or even in the federal government, the federal government has the same thing that we all have, and that is our sacred cows. Those sacred cows and the, the, the reality that in, 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 uh, in, in, the, in the myriad of topics that this, this organization manages, the, the analogy of, of suggesting that, that this team drinks through a fire hose is really underplaying the, the uh, the volume of inf information and data and varying um, issues and constituencies that, that this group has to manage. 
how do you do that when human nature and organi the organizational dynamics of groups has people and organizations bidding to have their sacred cow, if you will, pushed up the priority list uh, at, the, at the expense sometimes of other organizations, other individuals. That, that natural occurrence is really, in my mind, going to be a, a major roadblock to this organization doing the things that it really has to do. And can this organization rise above um, those, those natural human nature tendencies? And we talk a lot about collaboration, and clearly that's, that's important. But in my mind, it's got to go even beyond collaboration to an organization that can do what, what Peter suggested, of rising above the voices, people who can um, actually put their own states, their own tribes, the federal government's um, priorities off to the side somewhere and actually work as one group to develop priorities and, 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 and initiatives that address everything in an integrated fashion. Um, and that, to me, is probably a, a task that is, that is monumental, and in my mind, is probably the biggest challenge this organization has. When you lick that one, I think the, the actual um, ecological, environmental, uh, uh, and economic issues become much easier to, um, uh, to get your head around and, and, and to deal with. And um, boy, I hope, I hope this organization can do that and not begin to get into those conversations that we're having at ASMFC of outboarding decisions to others, which I think is a, is a death knell of the organization. Didn't mean to be, uh, uh, Kevin, too negative, but I thought, you know, just talking about the organizational dynamics here is an important uh, aspect of the, of the entire process. Thanks, Kevin. As you all know, I mean, it's definitely critical, right? How do you deal with our own entrenched biases and interests, you know, and working through that stuff? Thankfully, our group doesn't have those distinct authorities. We, we have the ability to, to, to work with one another in a, a manner that's, you know, we're not telling anyone else what to do. Our, our authorities stem from our uh, home offices, shall, shall you say. Um, but I 100% hear you, and I think Ellen maybe mentioned it before in talking about how we're managing the users of resources. <laughs> We've also got to figure out how to manage the managers of, of all these things, right? So you know, understanding where that goes will be, be critical. So I think that's really helpful. Uh, Kim, I'll turn it back to you. If there's things you'd like to add. Oh, uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, so, so yes, uh, I will add and uh, maybe take a little different piece as well. Um, uh, uh, going back to what Bill had mentioned before with the One Water Initiative and the integrated approach, um, that is one of the main aspects of coastal management, which is striking the balance between uses and resources, which is, an, an as was mentioned, an undertaking in itself. In addition to the variety of impacts um, that we've just been discussing related to climate change. Um, beyond what I had mentioned previously regarding leveraging research and information needs, continued building upon the funding that's been provided to the regional ocean partnerships to update and improve data on the portal. Um, I see an opportunity for coordination on a regional scale, sort of what was just mentioned previously is an agree with Ellen on the information exchange, as well as identifying and engaging stakeholders, uh, including those that have been historically underserved. There is an opportunity for the lessons learned and the sharing of best practices on engagement so we can do it better locally. Um, and greater coordination uh, would help ensure that as a region, we have that built-in engagement in the way that we work and that we operate. Um, so I, I know that uh, our time is short going on, so I'm going to stop there and let uh, the others also take note. Great, Kim. Thanks. Yeah, a lot of it sounds exactly like a lot of us are, are in those coastal zone management agencies, and I think there's been a long history of that. And it just kind of continues with the same challenges we've been trying to address for a while. But figuring that out is going to be critical. Um, so 
Um, I'll turn it over to, to Katie if she has any perspective she'd like to raise here. Thank you for putting up with me. I am not used to this format, so <laughs> I am getting there and very slow with my mute button. Um, absolutely, ocean uh, resource management is critical for New Jersey due to the increasing demands on the ocean environment. And I think Peter very eloquently identified those competing needs and the importance of finding uh, just the right balance. And I, I kind of want to pause here for a minute. In my role uh, at DEP, I oversee the Office of Economic Analysis as well as uh, the DEP's Division of Science and Research. And I stop here um, and raise it because while we talk an awful lot about the science, it's also important to state that um, we're working awfully hard to examine uh, the best available economic literature and to meet with critical stakeholders um, to ensure that we have a solid understanding of this aspect of the climate threat, uh, because we do understand that um, climate change is probably the single most threat to our economy uh, that we have faced in our lives. And it's, uh, I think understanding that is critical to understanding the balance that we're all struggling to, um, to strike. But with respect to uh, comprehensive coordination and planning for ocean resources, um, we, we definitely need to coordinate um, and uh, we need to plan for ocean resources and uses uh, to ensure the sustainability of the ocean ecosystem, which is, as I said, vital to the state's residents, environment and the economy. And facing rapid changes in climate change and increasing demand to utilize the ocean for renewable energy, uh, compounded by the need for better management of existing uses and resources, New Jersey must continue to focus attention on increased coordination with federal agencies, neighboring state agencies, academic institutions, and other relevant uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, and because I oversee the Division of Science and Research, I'll also talk uh, a little bit about coordinating the data and the science, um, and I will show my inner nerd. Um, a great example of that coordination that I'm talking about uh, is the data developed and shared through the Mid-Atlantic Data Portal, which is very exciting. I perused it earlier today, and I understand that it has been critical to the responsible citing um, and also allows access to high quality data that goes into decisions relative to resource management in the ocean. And enhancing those types of efforts is really a great place to start. Um, consistent and comparable research and monitoring of the ocean environment is critical to understanding our impacts and our solutions, including funding from procurements for regional science and monitoring. And there are many, many groups working to advance this effort. Our neighbors uh, at NYSERDA have been doing great work. All of the individual states resource managers, federal agencies uh, responsible for various resource protections, and of course, the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, or ROSA, um, is advancing regional research and monitoring of fisheries and offshore wind interactions, and the establishment of the Regional Wildlife Science Entity, which I think we heard about earlier today, to support research and monitoring on wildlife and offshore wind energy. So in all of these ways, greater coordination is key to ensuring that we're not duplicating effort at a time of uh, scarce resources and that we are being responsive to issues as quickly as possible. And we, we need to look at offshore transmission planning as well to meet our goals. Um, the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities is working closely with the grid operator to fully integrate transmission planning into the grid. And the planning for where and how we site these cables will be critical to reaching our goals. So uh, to sum up, developing uh, consistent or compar compar comparable requirements for mitigation, both ecological and for fisheries, uh, to the impacts that we cannot avoid um, are opportunities that we must embrace. Thanks again. Thank you, Katie. That's great. No, and I think it's really good to, to really highlight those economic concerns, right? And then I think that's a, a major driver in New Jersey is in, in the equity of those economic concerns as well. So not only do we make sure that our, our impacts to different things isn't too great, but how do we also share that, that equity around uh, of these, our climate solutions? So, um, and then I'll now I'll turn it over to Doreen again, if she would join us and give her perspective. Great. Uh, closing it out, uh, I couldn't agree more with my colleagues and all of the points that they had made, but I think the, the key point here is that simply stated, wildlife and fisheries do not follow human borders. 
So to address ecosystem change, whether it be from a change in climate or from offshore wind development, as has been discussed, you know, research at a range of spatial scales, including regional monitoring inside and outside of project areas is, is simply critical. Um, and as Kate mentioned, we at NYSERDA support such regional coordination through the Regional Offshore Science Alliance, ROSA, and as I mentioned before, the Regional Wildlife Science Entity. Of course, these groups bring together stakeholders, but the perspectives and the sectors that are represented are, in my view, the most critical. Together, we have agreed on regional research um, priorities. We've developed new data and we've facilitated information exchange across organizations and agencies uh, fundamentally to help promote greater consistency in how wildlife and fisheries are addressed across projects. And as we look forward, um, assurances for continued funding for these critical efforts is an important opportunity to ensure improved regional coordination continues. When we discuss offshore wind development, one topic we haven't mentioned is cable installation and landfall. And I would say that that is another very complex issue where we need to be sensitive to nearshore and offshore ecological and culturally sensitive locations, as well as the users of these spaces. So this is another great example of necessary coordination between, in this case, federal, tribal, and state agencies in discussions regarding cable issues. So that would be burial depths, crossings, and related topics, which will be even more essential as we see a proliferation of undersea cable um, expansion. So regional conversations about how cables affect maritime uses and result in environmental disturbance will need to be appropriately balanced with offshore wind development goals. So that is a focal point of New York states and broadly the regions at this point. So certainly much like my prior points, uh, standardizing and streamlining will be beneficial to stakeholders and the industry alike. But we cannot forget the opportunity that these resources present. Um, we are help, helping to responsibly retire aging fossil-based resources. So we are not only driving billions of dollars of investment into our grid, but we are delivering significant benefits to environmental justice and disadvantaged communities. So in our view, we are not only providing benefits to community health, but also enabling those in the community to take advantage of these um, economic development opportunities. So in general, there's a lot to unpack here. There are a multitude of, of issues to deploy and understand, but in general, we are making good progress and we look forward to continued close coordination with regional states, tribal nations, and federal agencies to maximize this opportunity and this equitable transition. Great, thank you, Doreen. Thank you. Uh, really that, you know, a lot of the work that you're doing is, is helping inform that stuff, so that's great. And I think you know, data information sharing across has been a, a consistent theme. Um, you know, I know we're, we're running down on time here, but we do have some, some time for a panel discussion amongst everyone. So I invite everyone to, to put their cameras back on and yeah, turn on, on their mics. If they'd like to have a discussion here, we can bring everyone back up and I, uh, hopefully we can get Kelsey back on and see if she has anything that she'd like to, to bring to the discussion, what she's just heard. And, and so uh, maybe I'll turn it to her first if, she'd, if she's still there. <laughs> I think I'm still here existing. I don't know if my, there's my camera. Okay, good. I'm with you. <laughs> um, so I just want to say thanks to, to all of the um, other representatives for sharing uh, their thoughts. I, I don't know that I, that I have much to add, just that I think that I was um, enthusiastically encouraged by the sense of consensus from everyone's remarks today, which means that we're hopefully doing the right thing in terms of regional ocean partnerships and our coordination and collaboration is actually leading to action. So I um, am, am very, again, very enthusiastically encouraged by what I heard today and hope that um, we can, can see some more initiatives come out of what was shared. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Guys. Yeah, I think, you know, this stuff is really, it's really promising, right? This is this is why we do these things. It's it's really how can we advance 
all these challenges that we're you know, faced with and, and how we make solutions that make the most sense and, and help the most people. So does anyone, I'm just gonna start off, let's just see if anyone has any other initial reactions, if they wanna respond to anyone else. I know the format allowed a lot of people <laughs> to kind of cover what other folks had talked about, so to, to bring that up, but uh, I'll yield that. So um, I, I know, you know, there's there's been discussion. Um, we talked a lot about some of those initiatives at the CZM level, you know, where states who have certain authorities, um, and then we have feds on a different level have different authorities. Are there, are there things that we can do to kind of bridge those gaps? Um, it, it might not already exist. Is there? Does anyone have ideas that there there might be something else that we need to ask for to you know, advance these things? Yeah. I, I think our, our small spaces can can do so much in, in collaboration and sharing, but is there any other asks that we might want to see? Well, I think I'll just I'll jump in while others are, are thinking. I also just wanted to say so much of a thank you to, to Bill and to others for the attention that you drew and the work that you're doing in terms of the One Water campaign. Um, that is something that has been very near and dear to my heart because it's sort of the essence of what has sort of been the, uh, I think, long-standing concern among indigenous participation in these spaces is the bifurcation of water into salt water and fresh water and coastal and waste and ocean. And, and, and for many of our indigenous community members really feeling like, that type of siloing is a disservice to the conservation efforts and the ocean planning efforts that we're trying to have undertaken. It really needs to be, as you mentioned, more holistic, integrated. And so I would love to see you know, more of how we can champion that work at the MAKO level, at a broader regional level to be pushing forward the One Water principles that, that you mentioned and shared with us. You know, New Jersey, if I may, Kevin, is also working uh, to reorganize. We have recently reorganized to um, focus on uh, watershed management again. We sort of um, uh, disconnected our land and water decisions for a while. And there's, uh, there's my, my husband who, uh, who works also at the agency is fond of telling me that uh, New Jersey is one big watershed for the ocean. <laughs> um, and that's something that sometimes we forget because it's so big. Um, so whether we're working on harmful algal blooms or, um, or uh, long-term control plans for CSO, all of these issues are connected. So we are very much trying to head in that one water approach as well. I think it's critical um, and it's certainly critical for uh, environmental justice communities as well. So I, I also applaud that effort. Great. Uh, I, I'm sorry, can I jump in really quick there? <laughs> Uh, so, I, I, and I appreciate that. I am, and Delaware is a small state, right? The, and our whole state is considered coastal. Um, so no one location in the state is farther than a couple miles away from tidal water, right? So um, we're all considered coastal. But if you ask a, someone in the public, if, if you live in a coastal town or community, they think, I don't live at Rehoboth Beach. No, I'm, I'm not in the coastal town. I'm not a community. Um, I think there's a lot of um, education that needs to be done to make sure that people true and understand that how connected they are to the ocean and the, the water in, in general. Because I, again, Delaware is small and very, you'll get very different answers from people if you, if you ask them if they consider themselves part of a coastal community. The a majority, unless they were from uh, Lewis, Delaware, down to Fenwick Island, the that's what people think and envision in, the, in their minds as to what is a coastal community. So I think one of the challenges that we have um, as a region, as a group, is making sure that people understand um, that connectedness. And, and going along with the, that, I want to pick up on something I think Kate also mentioned in that um, activities that go on on land or in the near shore can and do have very serious impacts in, in federal waters outside the three mile limit. The, we've all learned over the years, 
the ocean is not as vast uh, as it was once considered. And there are a lot of people who live a few miles away and don't realize that they are part of the problem. And our, our government agencies at all levels will need a way to address that problem and to, to recognize that they're solving a problem that appears somewhere else downstream. We, we see that in some land-based activities where the farmer suddenly discovers that the pollution problem, you know, 15 miles downriver is caused by their hog farm, but that's 15 miles away. How could that be? So how can it be that, that an inland city is the source of the problem in uh, the fishery that's four, five, 10 miles off? That's great. I, yeah, I think understanding the interconnectedness of, of everything is, is critical and making sure all people are aware of how that stuff works um, and that, you know, your actions here are going to definitely have different impacts in different places. So uh, I don't want to cut off the discussion, but we do have another session coming up soon. And I, and I think it's going to be a great session. And I want to make sure there's some folks have a, a break in between to to jump between the two sessions here. So um, thank you all so much. I think this panel has been really great. I think you provided a lot of context and a lot of information for folks to, to think about and ways that we can kind of improve all our coordination moving forward and some some activities we need to accomplish. So I want to well, say thank, thank you. you. And I please stay tuned for the climate-induced ocean changes. Um, that's the next webinar up. That's coming up in, in really just like a minute or two. So <laughs> thank you all very much again. And uh, look thank, you. To with you all. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure.